first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and to share and to share this lecture with uh, Dr. Manuel um, Tabate. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Simon Enriquez from Amsterdam. Professor Simon Enriquez is coming from the University of Amsterdam. He's an expert in the field of uh, cardiogenic shock. It's a very attractive, a very challenging, very challenging topic, and um, it's a great pleasure for me to share you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for your expertise in this in this field. Muito obrigado. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think you should all be commended for a medal of endurance because you're still sitting in the room, and uh, I am aware that this is the talk. This is between your afternoon lunch or not your afternoon drinks and and further an enjoyable evening. So um, I, I don't uh, have very relevant um, um, conflicts of interest. I have some research grants, but they are not really related to uh, this topic. Um, but I have actually one conflict of interest is that I really want to get this talk uh, quickly out of the way because I'm really very much anxious for the game later on, which is uh, good tough against Ajax. Um, <laughs> And I really have to win this game. So I'm, apparently the dinner is in a place that there is no television. So I have to, <laughs> I have to see it on my cell phone or something. So, um, and this is just a first thought. So actually, the, the, we, we just mentioned the lady a couple of, uh, I think it was a second case that was just remembered. That was a case that had uh, a thrombotic complication in a patient that then became most likely, I'm, it was not mentioned, but I assume hypotensive and then probably became getting get into shock where from stenosis became thrombotic and bleeding so it's really complicated um but the, the matter of the fact is that i'm going to try and keep you awake for a couple of moments uh, with something that nobody knows basically anything about which is anti-thrombotics in cardiogenic shock and how to treat these patients of course, we have some experience in treating these patients, all people in the room, but basically if we want to look at uh, clinical evidence, there's very little meager uh, clinical evidence. You will know that cardiogenic shock is, um, is a condition which is associated with the hyperperfusion of uh, the organs and the heart, and it's associated with very, very high mortality risk. You all know this. And of course, it doesn't very much matter whether you arrive with a non-STEMI or a STEMI, um, Literature, literature says that STEMI has a higher rate of, um, of shock. I, I don't know. I see the worst shock with patients that present with, with non-STEMI. So I'm not sure. But acute MI and cardiogenic shock are, of course, very uh, tightly related. And I actually like to talk about cardiogenic shock, hyperperfusion, how to treat those patients pharmacologically. Uh, but I actually always focus more on the treatment of the um, let's say the uh, shock syndrome itself, rather than anti-thrombotics and anticoagulations, which is very strange because uh, these patients are often confronted with a variety of complications that are immediately associated with anti-thrombotics and anti uh, and uh, anti-coagulation and anticoagulative agents. So, the current the EEC guidelines actually highlight the fact that lack of evidence on antiplatelet and antithrombotic treatment in cardiogenic shock. And despite the lack of this randomized evidence, um, we just basically adopt uh, the recommendations from the acute MI into the patients with cardiogenic shock. And, and this is, of course, the best we have, but it's very good to think of every step of the way when you treat these patients. So what do we do with these patients? We, we treat them again like AMI patients. We, we, we give them aspirin, and then we give them uh, thioparidines, and then uh, we give them amfractionate heparin. And um, this is basically uh, probably a good thing to do in cardiogenic shock, <clears throat> because primary angioplasty, quick revascularization, is the only thing we should sensibly do in these patients presenting with cardiogenic shock. But let us just let us take a look on, on, on what um, aspirin and PY12 inhibitors, um, how they have, how they are um, and, and uh, how they are taken up in, in the body um, in the in this condition. 
So both agents are indicated as soon as STEMI is diagnosed, regardless of the condition, so cardiogenic shock, or um, whatever type of treatment. But we are only discussing here primary PCI at this time. And in cardiogenic shock, intestinal absorption is compromised due to low blood flow. And oral ingestion can, of course, be quite difficult um, because you see sometimes also nasogastric tubes coming out of a patient, blood coming out of the patient, and uh, tubes being inserted into the uh, trachea. So we need to look at alternative routes. So for aspirin, we are safe. Aspirin is a good, a good agent. Uh, it's like heparin. We, it's a complicated agent that was developed for something else, but we're using it now for anticoagulative effects. Heparin is basically a very messy compound, but we are using it for anticoagulative effects, so it's interesting that these two are still the cornerstone therapy of primary angioplasty. And in the acute study, and I will show you some, some, some slides uh, next slide, um, in acute, uh, single dose uh, intravenous aspirin compared to oral aspirin um, resulted in a more faster and more complete inhibition of the thromboxane generation and platelet aggregation. As can be seen here, you see it um, not only, I'm um, oh, sorry, uh, so not uh, only a um, more quick, but also a deeper um, uh, inhibition uh, earlier on with IV aspirin. Uh, and it's also what we do in, I would say, in the vast majority of the uh, centers in the, in the Netherlands. However, when we, we move on to um, the next uh, agent, P2Y12 inhibition, then we have some more things to say. And of course, much has already said uh, earlier on today, so again, I'm not going to say very new things to you. I'm just going to go through a few items that may help you to consider what type of therapy to choose when you are confronted with these patients. So, there is inadequate PY12 inhibition if you just choose for all agents. And if you have nothing else, then at least you can use crushed ticagrelor through a nasogastric tube, uh, and that will lead earlier on to uh, inhibition rather than just oral uh, tablets uh, being ingested in patients. And this was actually very nicely tested in a, a study uh, in patients who had cardiac arrest, so they, they were not in cardiogenic shock, but at least temporary, they were, had been, they have been in some sort of shock because they had, were arrested. So I would say it, perhaps it's a temporary shock, and at least we could, could show that um, using crushed ticagrelor actually led to a more uh, quicker absorption of um, uh, more, a better and quicker um, uh, antiplated therapy uh, in these patients. Can I just ask uh, anybody of you used uh, crushed ticagrelor before, let's say, cangular came in? Anyone? Just a quick raise of hands. Yeah, we also did that. We actually quite quickly adopted, and we actually we sometimes even do it when patients are on the table and not preloaded. We actually crush them, and then it's the way we pretreat those patients. Um, what is also interesting is we are talking only about the agents that reach the gut, but then, of course, uh, many of these agents need to be transformed biologically before they become an active drug. And in contrast to ticagrelor, clopidogrel and prezogrel actually require this biotransformation by liver enzymes. And, and so this is another thing that you could at least consider when, of course, we just recently discussed non-STEMI and STEMI and rather stable hemodynamic conditions. Um, this completely becomes different when you go into cardiogenic shock. There is no or very limited gut absorption, and then some agents will take longer before they are biotransformed into their active agents. So I, so I would say intuitively, You'd, you'd go more preferably in this case for the ticagrelor as it is available at this time for the cardiogenic shock patients. Another item that uh, at least I uh, had very little knowledge about until very recently is the effect of opiates and, and sedation. Uh, I mean, opiates are frequently given as sedation 
in these patients, uh, either before they arrest completely or during the intubation. And it's interesting to understand that opiates are actually uh, have an interaction in the, um, in the bioavailability of the P2Y12 inhibitions. And um, we see all these anesthetists uh, give everything into the intravenous lines, but I have never actually considered the fact that what is being given into the intravenous line may actually affect my anticoagulative and antithrombotic um, effects. And it's actually um, quite interesting to become aware of that and to understand that if you actually give morphine, and this is just morphine, but if you give morphine, that you actually, uh, that your, um, let's say, inhibition is delayed. So uh, if you have patients who are, who you, you have treated with, um, with PY12 inhibition and you give them morphine, you are delaying its active, uh, its active condition of the medication. So, as many of you already, and the former speakers have already said, um, perhaps, or I would say in this case it's rather self-explanatory, giving Kangaroo intravenously is at this time, I think, a good alternative uh, that gives us a way to circumvent all the issues that we've just discussed until now. It's a rapid onset and consistent effect, and also rapid offset, is, I think, very important when we're treating these patients that sometimes are thrombotic and then perhaps as soon as you give them, I don't know, a machine to pump the heart, suddenly become uh, um, uh, in a different type of animal and they start to bleed. So it's, it's interesting to use such a, a, a therapy that you can more or less tailor very well over time. And this slide's shown before, and this is just, again, resummarizing the, the things that we've just said. The question is, however, um, also this modality of how, it, how the action of how, it, how this, uh, let's say, drug works has also not been, I would say, thoroughly tested in cardiogenic shock. Is this really, is this really the way uh, the drug performs? And is this really the route in uh, cardiogenic shock or does this let's say, recovery of the inhibition, is it perhaps delayed? So there's a variety of questions that still are there, specifically in patients who suffer from cardiogenic shock. So the pooled champion results, uh, they were already uh, touched upon, show that compared with clopidogrel or placebo, Kangalore uh, reduced um, uh, thrombotic complications. This is not shock data, of course. Uh, but at the expense of bleeding. One trial to look forward is, and I think that's a very interesting uh, study, is uh, at, uh, that's the DEPT shock study, who's trying at this time to, um, to use cangalore compared to crushed uh, ticagalore in, in cardiogenic shock patients. Uh, at this time, actually, uh, we in Amsterdam do something else, and I will get back to that. I will I'll come to that in a, in a while. So this is just a Phoenix study. I'll just switch on to that because much has been said about this already. And I'd like to just to stand still a bit at this, uh, at this study, um, which is the concomitant uh, use of Ticargalor and Cangalor. Cantec was a, a small size study, suggested that Cangalor is an effective strategy to bridge the gap in platelet inhibition and that crushed ticagrelor can be administered simultaneously with cangrelor without any drug interaction in patients with uh, primary PCI. This is actually exactly how it is here, what we do uh, at currently in our institution. Uh, patients come in um, before we uh, give cangrelor, and if there's some doubt about what's going on, I like to understand what is going on, so I sometimes do an angiogram before I start doing stuff. Um, but if there is a clear occlusion or, or everything is in sign that there isn't a coronary occlusion, then um, we crush the cangle, uh, we crush the ticagrelor, we give it through a nasogastric tube, and we immediately also initiate the cangrelor. So we hope by that way to bridge that gap that we have discussed. The question is, how long is that gap? And is that gap really closed? And how are we monitoring the length? How long should we treat Kangalore? 
how long should we treat the patients with cancer for? So that's really uh, uh, still things that we, we need to do. But let's take a look at, at the Cantex study. Although very small study, just 50 patients randomized from the original 100, um, they were very nicely anal uh, analyzed, so crushed ticagrelor against crushed ticagrelor in the other arm, and then adding on cangrelor. And what you see here is what you would really like to see, is that you, you give the cangrelor and immediately the platelet reactivity goes down. And after a few hours, you then uh, see that the levels uh, get uh, next to each other. So this is really what you want to see. And of course, the time where this placebo will come in the, uh, in the arm with cardiogenic shock is very likely to be much longer. Um, but of course, we also do not know how long we should treat these patients with cangrelor. So how long, usually the, the sequences of cangrelor are just a couple of hours, but is a couple of hours enough? Is that enough? Or are we then not getting, perhaps we have a, a good uh, inhibition of the platelet during a few hours, and then suddenly you have a rebound effect, which is perhaps especially in cardiogenic shock patients, even worse than in normal STEMI patients who have normal blood pressure, normal coronary pressures, whereas the cardiogenic shock patients, they have a low blood pressure in the coronary arteries. So, of course, uh, this, this study was just a small uh, study, and the shock patients were self-explanatory, of course, um, uh, not in this uh, study. Bleeding complications are very important, and they occur a lot of patients. They occur in a lot of patients. And just again, just a, a mild show of hands, um, how, um, let's say, do you use mechanical support devices of any type of device in about 20% of cases, at least 20%? At least 20%? Just one? Cardiogenic shock? One, two, three, more? So, and, and just the mere introduction of such a device, and I like to use these devices, but just the mere introduction of this device will yield, um, will yield your bleeding, uh, will give you a bleeding no matter what. So you'll have, not 100, it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, but depending on the type of device, and it was already alluded to by the ECMO, you will, you will introduce a bleeding effect. And if you put that in perspective to the evidence of using these devices for circuitry or support, then you really have to understand, uh, are we doing the right thing? And this is why actually, in cardiogenic shock, I am extremely reluctant to use massive doses of GPI or whatsoever, because it, it, you really have to take into account the bleeding once you introduce devices, especially if there are larger bore devices. And of course, we don't have any management tools to, to think of how to do that. So are we, let's say we have uh, a very uh, sick patient, do we then uh, adopt uh, our pharmacologically agents? Do, does anybody of us, I, I, when I start on an Impella or ECMO, I still give them aspirin and ticagrelor and heparin, and, and we don't know how to deal with that. Perhaps we can actually skip one of the medications and reduce their bleeding enormously, but we just don't do it because we're too afraid for the thrombotic risk. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, um, did I, um, yeah. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I basically already now come to the conclusion, so you're happy that it's a short talk. Um, I have uh, just uh, a few things that I can say. Current recommendations on antithrombotic therapy is mostly based on extrapolation for from AMI studies without cardiogenic shock due to lack of any evidence in the subgroup. I think it's very uh, logical for us all here that IV strategies are the way to go with uh, these patients. And I would uh, like to urge you to also consider the bleeding risk of these patients that we always as interventionists basically want to have the artery open, but as soon as the patient gets into the intensive care, uh, they consider that less because they have to manage the bleeding all the time, especially when they have support devices. So, ladies and gentlemen, I know I started with this slide about, um, about this football game, right? And uh, I know my talk was rather more speedily than you perhaps had anticipated. Um, 
But actually, this morning I saw a, um, a statement from the trainer from Ajax, who said um, Ajax moet slim zijn uh, tegen het niet alledaagse Getafe, which is Ajax needs to be sl uh, needs to be smart to win from Getafe. And actually, it's one of the items that actually also touched in my mind when I think we actually don't really know how to play against Getafe. We have to be smart about it. And in cardiogenic shock, we also don't really know how to play to, uh, to, this, to, this, uh, to this disease. But we have to really be smart with what we know from other studies, but also be aware of the dangers that lie ahead. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I have a question regarding uh, hypothermia. Is something else that normally you give to the patient, uh, try to uh, prevent the neurological damage. What is uh, your uh, strategy in terms of pharma in those patients receiving hypothermia? So, um, at least um, given, given the level of evidence that's available now, uh, hypo so we don't drive to hypothermia anymore, we just don't want to warm them up, so uh, we, we, we don't really actively cool them, we just keep them at uh, temperature. Um, the only thing that we find is that they, uh, in the older days when they really became hypothermic, then of course the blood pressure went down, and then you sometimes had to stop with your hypothermia and then were afraid that you'd lose the brain. But I think at this time, uh, given what's out there that with hypothermia, we don't do too much on infarct size reduction, we don't do too much on brain preservation, and we do a lot on hypotension and uh, reducing the inotropism of the heart. I think that is perhaps, um, at least in our institution, less of a problem currently than it was earlier on. I'm not sure whether some sites still actively pursue uh, deep hyperthermia in these uh, shock patients. Not deep anymore, uh, normal thermia or... Uh, yeah. Any, yes, uh, please. Yeah. And Marco and Jose Luis later. To that topic, using, using MCS in, uh, in cardiogenic shock, I think there are two very important points. Firstly, um, the MCS is not a, uh, just a pump. The main benefit is to unload the left ventricle. So if you want to have benefit from the MCS, you have to put it very early in the, in the development of the shock. If you put it after two hours, you cannot skip it. That's the first point. The second one is um, in the IFUs of Impella, for instance, you will see there 25,000 units of heparin because of the, you know, because of the release of the device. Mm -hmm. That's rubbish. You can use it without any heparin and then you, you'll have not this, you know, this um, peak of uh, ACT over mm -hmm. not measurable or something. So just don't give heparin, give only 1,000 uh, units and the rest uh, IV. Okay, can I, can I comment on that a bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I do agree that um, you have I am actually a big favor of uh, pre-PCI impella implantation. Um, but I, I, I thought if I'm going to talk and, and deep into that, then perhaps things get a little bit away from the topic. But so uh, if I come back to what I usually do, I, I usually assess or try to assess as best as possible the patient. So first, is the shock really myocardial? Is the heart really silent? And I sometimes in, indeed do put in an impella without heparin. Uh, it's, it's not entirely rubbish in, this, in the sense that you can, I mean, um, the impella will run for days, but the sensors on impella, uh, especially now for the fiber optic express, but uh, in the still currently available impellas, they will uh, lose their sensors earlier on if they are not fully anticoagulated. So, so yes, uh, make an image of the coronary arteries, make an image of the femoral artery, uh, and then put in an impella, and then uh, give enough uh, heparin to do your PCI, and then close up, uh, and, but keep your anticoagulant uh, therapy perhaps a little bit lower than you usually do. Uh, Marco? I was wondering whether you can comment upon the Cantic study you referred to. One way of looking into the study is the way you read the study. So if you give an IV drug, 
you are <coughs> inhibiting the drug more than a, a crushing a pill, makes sense. But there is also another way of looking into the study. Mm -hmm. If you take a patient who is on steady state after prasugal tecagro, the mean PRU value will be either 5 or 20, respectively, with tecagro and prasugal. Now, in Cantic, the mean PRU in STEMI patient at 30 minutes, which was the time, which was the primary point time frame, mm -hmm. was actually 70, 70. So the way I see in the Cantic is that Kangol is not as potent as I actually thought. Can you comment on yeah, this? Can I just? Uh, I, um, let's look at the, uh, this. Is not what I have read. It. Can, can we? Uh, is it possible to get the slides back up? Because I don't. I, I can't just from the back of my head. Uh, so it's, you say it's seven hours difference. I didn't see that. Block seventeen. I will speak about PRU. PRU. Flat Oh, you mean the 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 the, the, the deepness of the uh, inhibition? Yeah, uh, I really I can't. Um, uh, if if it's not possible, oh, oh, I have to do it. Now. Okay. Yeah. Here we go through all the slides. So there's actually um, another figure in the original paper where you have a more uh, way where they're all all patients are in it, and um, and and there you, I mean, the, the, so yes, the perhaps is the the, the let's say the, the the deep effect is less than you'd expect it, but as you see this clear dissipation between the two different uh, groups. No, so that's weird. Yeah. I don't, I don't have any, um, I, don't, I don't know about that, so, yeah. You, any more? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how, especially with the standard uh, deviation. However, I think one important aspect of the Cantic study was just to show that you don't have to reload the patients right after you stop Cangrelor, which with Prasugrol, rec the recommendation is to reload, right? So Ticagro and Cangrelo are so similar as molecules uh, that you don't have to reload. And this is, I think, one of the main messages of the Cantex study, if you agree, Marco. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what, 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 could you, Mark, could you, I, I don't, what is, what, what are you trying to, to convey here? I, I, I'm not getting the real sense of your question, actually. You mean that in, in the steady state in patients who have, uh, in steady state presocryl and, and clopidogrel, that they are more inhibited than they are here in Cangrelor and STEMI? Yes, that's exactly the message. Uh, if you look at the historical phase, fi phase dose funding studies of Cangrelor, you always, this is 99% inhibition, mm -hmm. you turn the infusion off, after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, the patient is gone back to normal. Yeah, you don't see 99% inhibition. Mm -hmm. If you would do an LTA, that would be probably 50% inhibition, 40% so, inhibition. That is quite surprising. So I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not aware, but the, does this resemble STEMI uh, inhibition, uh, platelet inhibition in, with, with Prasugol? Do you know of those, those data? Yeah, yeah. Steady state, actually, you have bigger effect with Prasugol or Tecagro than uh, what you see there. With in STEMI, even. In, in STEMI. STEMI, of course. Okay. Yeah, the, the other, the other issue, the other <coughs> issue when when you use cangrelor, even in patients with cardiogenic shock or out of the cardiogenic shock, is exactly the the right time to load with our oral, oral agents, uh, because it, it is not exactly the same when you load with clopidogrel or when of you course. load no, with cangrelor. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, no, exactly. It's it's. I mean, they're the molecules are so alike. So it's 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 continuation is makes much yeah. more sense. 
Yes, please. Just a, a quick question about uh, a patient with a cardiogenic shock. I understand that you are uh, actually using Kangalore in, this, uh, in these patients. And my question is, do you use it at a full dose or uh, taking into consideration that these patients are also, as you have said, uh, at high risk of bleeding? You, uh, maybe in some cases you reduce the dose of, of Kangalore. You, well, we know that yeah. it's a dose-dependent effect, and maybe you don't need a 90% inhibition of the P2I12 uh, pathway, but maybe you need like a copilator-like effect. In some cases, you reduce the, the infusion, or you use it always like in PCI. Well, I think this is uh, this would be, I think, a very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, design to, to try and find out, because uh, now we, you put in, let's say, you put in a device, and the groin starts to bleed, and you're just following instructions for use. And the question is, could you indeed perhaps not reduce your, your infusion rate? You'll probably give the same bolus rate, but then you could perhaps reduce your, um, your infusion rate. But again, it's, it's a, a thin line between the thrombotic risk and, and, and the uh, bleeding risk. And I, I wonder whether in, in this particular patient group, again, it's not been, tested, it's not been tested, perhaps that, that measuring uh, anticoagulation anti could perhaps guide us a little bit. I'm not sure what the definition would be to think of it as sufficient, um, but it's just that uh, in, this petition, in this particular patient group, we're basically always doing it not completely right for the whole group. One question more from the audience. Or yeah, comment? very short. So, a, any role for tyrofiban instead of uh, cangrelor in these patients? It, I'm, I have always, with the uh, GPI, I always see so much bleeding. Um, and I'm, especially when you use impellas or ECMOs, they just bleed everywhere. And I must say, with, with Kangalore, again, uh, I know we're here for Kangalore, but I, I don't see it that often. So I think it's, uh, and I think you mentioned it, it's, it's, it seems like a much more safer bleeding profile uh, rather than tyrofoban. But it's just, uh, I don't know. How many do you do of these cases, right? It's, it's not like you do a 50 per patient, per physician, per month. So it's, it's really diluted over the time. Any more comments? Or? Can, you can you stop? OK, thank you so much. Please let, let me advertise an interesting. Last, uh, last week was published uh, online an interesting manuscript from the World Group <coughs> of Thrombosis, EAPCI, and ACA, exactly with this topic. Oh. Antithrombotic therapy in cardiogenic shock and after cardiac arrest was published online last year. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's not different from your talk. Thank you so much, and thank you so much.